I want to jump right into this because you're a well of knowledge. I love learning from you. You have such a unique revelation on so many things that I'm like, wow, I didn't even, you know. So let's, can we just jump in? And, and But before we jump in with this first thing, you're doing something super special. So on YouTube, you're constantly teaching. You're going live. I'm jumping in your, I'm, I'm in your chat on the regular. So today, if people jump in, it's, uh, you, you want to, we want to try to crack 500 subscribers. Right. And you are making a free ebook copy of your first book, Secrets of Deliverance, available. Is that true? Yeah. So um, we're trying to build um, our YouTube page. We're almost, we're literally almost at the cusp of 100K subscribers. So what we're doing special is for the next 500 subscribers, I'm counting it here, we're going to give you a free ebook copy for one hour. For one hour, which means exclusively for those of you that are here, um, we'll give you a free ebook copy of The Secrets to Deliverance. That way you don't have to purchase it. And that way you can kind of follow along. If you're jumping in and getting to know us in part two, The Secrets to Curses, then you'll be able to have along with it um, its predecessor. Um, and it's The Secrets to Deliverance. So I'm going to be putting the links up in the chat room. So we want you to just go sub right now in our YouTube page, and then you'll get a free ebook copy of The Secrets to Deliverance available just for this broadcast for um, right now, because I love all of you viewers that are watching right now. You got, you're so <laughs> generous. Listen, guys, I can't even believe that's real. Uh, so go ahead. Matter of fact, if you don't have the book, go and subscribe right now. It's it's okay to actually jump off my channel, go subscribe, come back, or just open up two tabs or use another device. Go and do it right now, and let's crack 100K in the next 24 hours. I would love that. So Amen. go ahead and subscribe to his channel. Yeah, it's such good, 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 good content. So I just want to start by asking the question. Um, I'd love to hear your answer on this. I know that your new book, The Secrets to Generational Curses, is, is about this topic, but let's start with the fundamentals. What is a generational curse? Well, a generational curse or a curse is a warranted verdict given by the courtroom of heaven against a person, a household, a place that committed a transgression that warrants that level of penalty. Now, let me just first start off by saying that not every sin produces a generational curse. First John chapter five actually says that there are sins that do not lead unto death. And then there are sins that do lead unto death. And then it says, all wickedness is sin. You know, and I, I guess the, the apostle John wrote that for the heresy hunters. Oh, my brother, are you saying that all sin, you know, not all sin is, 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 is wrong? No, the apostle John said all sin is wrong. But the text says, 1 John chapter 5, not all sin leads unto death. Let me give you an example of how this works. If me and my, argument had a, if me and my wife had an argument and the rapture happened, trust me, me and my wife will be arguing our way to heaven. <laughs> yeah. Because arguing with my wife doesn't warrant a generational curse. But if I commit adultery on my wife and the rapture might happen and I'm caught in the middle of adultery, well, now we're talking about the different degrees of penalty. This is why even in our uh, constitution, you have robbery in the first degree, robbery in the second degree, robbery in the third degree. The same is with the courtroom of heaven. So yeah, wow. so the demon and the curse are not the same, but the curse originates from the courtroom of heaven. It's the courtroom of heaven producing a verdict against a family, a place, a territory, a company, because that group of people or the individual has committed a sin that warrants that level of penalty and consequence. Mm, that is so good. So what you're saying, and I just want to break this down for people watching, because many of you are joining right now. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you haven't. Ring that bell notification and then drop a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. I see a lot of you guys entering right now. So let me ask you just straight up. So it, it, could it be that if somebody's dealing with chronic illness in their body, that that is a curse, but that that curse was not necessarily their own sin, but the sin of one of their ancestors, that they inherited that? Okay, so let's first, let's address, could a Christian have a generational curse? Let's just kind of go yeah. there a little bit before I actually answer that, because I can hear the theological wheels turning in, in various people's mind. Well, it's impossible Christian uh, can't be under a generational curse. Then why do Christians that are born against spirit-filled believers still die in the natural? Like, Come on. Let's yep. just answer that. We're Christian, we're spirit-filled, 
why do we still die in the natural? Why? Because, well, isn't that a generational curse still coming down from Adam? Yeah. See the thing? So, like, let's just kind of fix that. So then you're probably saying, okay, your viewers are probably saying, well, what, well, what does the efficacy of Christ's work on the cross accomplish? Very simple. The, cr the cross mm. broke the power of sin, not the presence of sin. Just like the cross broke the power of the curse, not the presence of curses. So that's kind of like where we, where we, I think, need to hang our theological tangents and just say, you know what, you know, maybe a Christian, you know, could be a generational curse. So then, how does one identify? Yeah, maybe yeah. I have a generational curse. This is the best way to identify it. It's found in two, in in two, in two ways. One. After you've crucified the flesh, if the problem persists, it's a demon. Watch this. Mm. After you go through deliverance and the problem still persists, then it's a curse. Wow. That's how you that's how you so identify good. it's a curse. All right. So let's 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 look at let me say that again. After you gouge out your eye because your eye causes you to sin, if you find you're still lusting, then you have a demon of lust. If you go through a deliverance session and you find yourself still lusting after you've uh, gotten multiple deliverance sessions, now you're dealing with a generational curse of lust and perversion. The same as with sickness, the same as with uh, uh, hereditary patterns of behavior. It is all there and it is actually scriptural. So that is the best way that a Christian could say, you know, what? maybe maybe I could not not just be dealing with uh, sickness. Maybe terminal sickness is run through our bloodline and maybe it needs to be resolved in the courtroom and not necessarily through a deliverance session. Oh, this is so good. Come on, everybody hit the thumbs up on this video right now if this is helping you already. You know what I love about the way that you teach? It's so profound and there's such a level of depth, but then it's digestible. It's like that just clicked and there's so much bad information. Some of you guys are YouTube theologians. You know what I mean? You've never even read a book. And so you've got opinions, but this to me is bringing so much peace because it's clarity. Now I want to piggyback off that because we're kind of flowing together right now. And you know, what does the book of Ezekiel mean when God says kicking about in your own blood? And then there's this other phrase, no one can uh, cut your umbilical cord. How is, well, how uh, is that connected? Listen, I talk about that extensively in my book, The Secrets uh, to ge uh, Generational Curses. But that is, for me, the ace in the hole uh, when it comes to generational curses and like hands down, mic drop moment. The book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is given a vision concerning uh, the nation of Israel. Obviously, m most of the vision uh, that Ezekiel is receiving is in reference to, if you want to be exegetical, is in reference to the nation of Israel. But also, we are the nation of Israel spiritually. We are the spiritual yeah. descendants of Abraham by faith in Christ. So what it actually is talking about is this. If you read it, it's he's speaking in parabolic form to help Israel understand what's going on. And he starts off by saying, this is this is this this statement here blew me away. And I don't want to give too much away because you need to go get the book. And no. we'll be yeah, we'll, be, I, we'll be putting the link in the chat room in a few. All right, let's get these numbers up to 500 subscribers and then we can give you this free ebook. But it starts off by saying this. God starts off the prophetic declaration by saying this. You are nothing but a Canaanite and your mother is an Amorite. <laughs> by default, he's already talking about that the root issues of all of your national problems is the direct result of that you're not really a Hebrew in origin. You're actually a Chaldean, you're a Canaanite and what? an Amorite in your root. And he actually says, your father was nothing but a Canaanite and your mother was an Amorite. And then he says this, and I walked by you when no one paid attention to you wow. and I called you to myself. Boom, that's salvation. That's salvation yeah. right there. Yeah. And then it says, but because you were still young and not ready for love, which means covenant, which yeah, means covenant, yeah. I kept going. Look what it says. I kept going, allowing you to kick about in your own blood. And then I passed by again. This is what he says. I passed by again, and I saw you kicking about in your own blood or your own bloodline issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it says, because 
No one cut the umbilical cord from the moment you were conceived, which means the Christian can be born again, but then God, you might not necessarily be ready for a deliverance session or de dealing with generational curses. Why? Because God wants to begin to deal with you with your foundational issues, your born again experiences and helping you mature. And then, you know, you, your newfound faith, but nevertheless, you belong to him. He claimed you as his, mm -hmm. but the umbilical cord hasn't been cut until you're ready. And that's when the Christian starts dealing with uh, things that even though they're growing in their Christian faith, they hit this roadblock. They hit this, this wall, this, this invisible wall that's there, and they're doing everything right. The issue is a deliverance issue or a generational curse issue. And then it says this, I cut the umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. I wiped you clean from your blood or your bloodline issues watch this and then i declared marriage vows unto you wow. i declared marriage vows unto you and i dressed you uh i adorned you which means up to that point you're christian still dealing with bloodline issues not ready for high levels of the anointing and ministry wow. and then God revisits you and then he breaks the generational curse and now you're ready to covenant with God in the area of intimate relationship and then get adorned with high levels of the anointing uh, depending on what God has called you to do. And then it says from there, it says, and then you grew exponentially. Watch this. And then it says, and now you were ready to make love and now reproduce. It actually, the whole chapter, Ezekiel chapter 16, wow. is talking about the nation of Israel, but it's also paralleling yeah. a Christian believer with generational curses. You got to get the book. You got to get the book. I'm going to put the link a little bit in the chat room. You got to get it because I go into more extensively what that adornment means and what the kicking about in your own blood. And no one cut the umbilical cord, which means churches and no one helped you cut your bloodline connection to your Amorite and your Canaanite roots. And therefore, you're saved, but you're kicking about in your own blood, which means you're having bloodline issues and you need someone to wash you and cleanse you from all of that and then it's make covenant with you. Man, we, uh, you got me preaching here. You got me preaching. Preach. And now listen, you guys got to get the book. I mean, this, this entire stream is to start a conversation. I want you to continue in the book. Here's the thing, though. It's possible, it's possible to be saved but be in chains. And there's many of you that confess Christ as your Savior, went to church every single Sunday. Nobody ever talked about demons. Nobody ever talked about a curse. And you were like, you just felt guilty. Why do I keep relapsing back into sin? Why do I keep struggling in these ways? And there's many of you that it's just this season of your life that you get somebody actually tells you what the Word of God says, that you're coming into higher levels of, of, of the glory, higher levels of the anointing. And I love, I love, love, love this. Um, you know, for me, and I just want to quickly tell people, we, my family was like this. My mom, you know, she took us to church. She saw a value in that. She accepted Christ as Messiah. He's Savior. You know, led us through the sinner's prayer. It wasn't until several years of going to church that we finally got this revelation on generational curses and deliverance. And then, then we shifted into another level. And there's many of you that are like, what is my next level in Christ? I, you know, this is it. And, and, and so this is so, 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 so important. You know, I, it's something that I feel like many people deal with and, and they're watching online right now and they have these mental struggles. You know, anxiety is increasing. Some of you have panic attacks. You're Christians that go through debilitating fear. It's crippling, uh, maybe a lot of doubt. You know, you're constantly experiencing that. Can you maybe talk a little bit about the curses of the mind? And, and you know, why is God focused on the human forehead? And, and I, I just because for me, I think I got, you know, hundred, hundreds of thousands of subscribers and followers and people. And there's so many times where I deal with the mind and, and I just get a lot of feedback about that. And I feel like God has gifted you in that area to help people experience freedom. So maybe you could talk about specifically curses of the mind. You know, well, not every sin produces a curse of yeah. the mind, but there are a couple that actually do. Mm. The Bible actually talks about um, stubbornness or stiff neckness. Wow. And you 
find that that becomes uh, one of the catalysts uh, for the nation of Israel uh, to be perpetually uh, given over uh, to other uh, other nations around them to uh, years of years of years of slavery. But what you do find is is that when a believer refuses to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the Bible actually says whatever uh, is not done of faith is actually sin, which means failing to take control of your mind can produce sins of the mind that convert themselves uh, or evolutionize themselves from one degree to the next. So you start off like this. You start off with uh, uh, defilement, and then it goes from, it starts off with contaminated to corrupted to defilement, uh, to detestable. It's, it's continuously stages. Now, the contamination stage doesn't produce a generational curse. Why? Because you can't control the thoughts that come in your mind, but you can control them from staying there. Wow. But if you don't remove them, then they go from stronghold to strong man. Now we're, now we're dealing with a vice grip that's, that's kind of like, that's kind of like there. And then perpetual long, years, uh, seasons of not fighting against the stronghold of your mind uh, ends up becoming iniquitous. Mm. So it, now the the genetics of how your mind thinks begins to get altered and it shifts everything. Why? Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh, as a mm. man thinketh, so is he. So that means your thoughts to some degree can, can actually shift the nature of who you are as a person to go from a place of contamination to corruption. And this is why the apostle Paul said, I fear, he said, I fear that as the, the devil deceived Eve, so your minds will be corrupted. Now watch this. When a mind is corrupted, that means it's completely shifted and cannot be uncorrupted. Why? Because now the nature of a thing, the nature of something has now been degraded. And once it shifts to that level, sometimes the only thing left for it to be done with is that's when God gives it over to a reprobate mind. And I deal extensively with a seared conscience and a reprobate mind and a strong delusion. This is why, because they not love, they love not the truth. God gave them over to a strong delusion, which means now they are cursed in the mind that even if the truth is presented to them, now they can no longer understand the truth. Seared conscience means the inability to distinguish between right and wrong because they've given themselves over to that. So now that is the place of their mind is cursed. Uh, not only that, their conscience becomes cursed. So that's why it is imperative that the believer is continuously, as the Lord's prayer is in Matthew chapter six, consistently praying, mm. deliver me from evil, daily deliverance, Lord, deliver me from evil. Now I'm not saying a phobia of God, my mind is gonna get you know overturned and corrupted, no. But Lord, take control of my mind. This is why the apostle Paul said, whatever is virtue, whatever is of praise, if there be of good report, think on these things. When a Christian fails to do so, after a long period of time, it goes from transgression, a mind that's filled with transgression, to a mind that is iniquitous, which means now the nature of that mind begins to get corrupted. And now you no longer need to be tempted to do those things. Now you're tempted by your own lust, James chapter one, which means now instead of lying, you're a liar. That's how it works. In the beginning, you're lying failing to repent of that, now your nature gets changed and now you're just a liar. So now you have a Christian. So then now all these other instances in the epistles begin to get put in play where now you begin to question whether you're even a believer or whether you lost your salvation, you know, and that's a whole other topic there. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of like where it starts, starts in the mind. Another example of this if yeah, you ask, yeah, keep going. is Cain. Cain is a perfect example of thoughts unregulated that became a curse. And what did God do to Cain? He said, now you are cursed. And because you are cursed, I put a mark on your forehead, which means inability to understand truth and repent. And therefore all this other stuff kind of kicks in, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So it is dangerous 
to make sure uh, in not renewing your mind because your mind can actually be altered and it is the gateway to everything else that we do in functioning in our lives as a Christian. Oh, that is so good. Have you all bought this book already, The Secrets to Generational Curses? I mean, we're spamming the chat and the pinned comment is the actual link to the book. My expectation is that every single one of you get this book right now because Christians need to understand this. Apostle Pagani is such a deep well of revelation for this generation. These books are, I mean, we're, we're speaking to one of the foremost writers on the topic and we have him here available in real time. What a what an incredible privilege. But I'm thinking about how many people have not been told these things. And, and you know, we've been talking about this a lot, but it's like your spirit gets regenerated. Your, your, your mind must be renewed, but then your body must be resurrected. And Come on. Christians don't understand this. And it's like that, that's how it's possible that your spirit gets regenerated and the Holy Spirit dwells inside of your spirit. And that is you, the eternal essence of you. Your mind needs to be renewed because it's constantly going back to a former state and you've Come got on. to take thoughts captive. Everything that erects itself up against the word of God, pull it down. You know, you've got to go through that process, but then your body, as you mentioned, is going to die and must be resurrected. Come and, on. and so you can be under the influence of demons in your body, which needs to be resurrected, in your mind, which needs to be renewed. And this is the fundamentals of, of what we've been trying to teach. And so maybe you can talk a little bit because, you know, I, what I hear you saying <laughs> is that there is a progression that Christians can go, and maybe it just starts with a thought. And you said a phrase, I love it, from stronghold to strong man. I've often given the example of if you leave your front door open, you know, probably a squirrel or a raccoon is not immediately going to come in. Right. It's like, you know, you have Saul who was vexed by demons and come on. David who wasn't. That's kind of confusing because didn't David mess up with Bathsheba? Didn't come David on. arrange for the murder of her husband? I mean, David wasn't a good dude either. Why wasn't he vexed by demons like Saul? Well, and I love the way you said this. It was David was quick to repent. It right. opened the door, but then yeah. quickly closed the door. And it's the same thing. You bring in the groceries from your house, you open the door. You know, you don't have a deer just waiting for you to crack that door open to kick it off the hinges. But then what happens is if you do leave that door open, which is the analogy of unrepentant, rep repetitive sin, then I'm saying over a period of time, you will have an infestation. Things will come in. So I hear you talking about progression. Um, I hear you talking about uh, unrepentant. Right. Uh, and so what happens now? And I don't, you know, what happens now? Like, what about the people who are listening who are like, this is me. I am a Christian by title, but I meditate and dwell on lust, perversion, doubt, fear, anxiety, worry, whatever. I'm, I, you know, I have now unforgiveness. I am that person that's gone from stronghold to strong man, that I am that person that's now gone into borderline reprobate. Right. What, and what do I do? Because I know there's people, I could feel it in the spirit right now, who are like, what do I do? Well, let me, let me add to that statement. You just said stronghold to strong man. There's a third part, to, uh -oh. strong, to strong case a case in the heaven. So it's from stronghold to strong man to strong case. So that's how it works. It all starts um, in the courtroom of heaven. I guess the first thing for your viewers to understand is if they are aware right now their present need of freedom in this area, then they're in a very good place. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is still working with them and yes. revealing it to them. Uh, most of the time, not all the time, but a large percentage of the time, when something gets to the place of getting cursed by heaven, it becomes immensely hard. It, immensely hard. We're talking about a Christian having a generation of curse. We're not talking about an unbeliever that's cursed by default because of they're not in covenant with God. We're talking about a Christian that has committed something that initiated the curse because the Bible says a curse doesn't come without a cause or they inherited it uh, based on generations of their bloodline committing 
uh, patterns of behavior that are in violation to the courtroom of heaven? Well, the first thing I would say is this, is go into intercession. This is, this is, this is what I've been teaching is, the reason why we struggle with concepts of generational curses is because modern evangelicalism has only uh, taught us to view Christianity from the place of relationship. We're only thinking relational. I'm here to tell you I'm here, that it's not just relational. You have to think legal. This, this, is all, this is all legal. So if you're thinking relational, you have a problem. But if you're thinking legal, um, then things change. Let me just kind of throw that out there. So, so then you go into intercession. See, when, I, when, when a Christian thinks of intercession, they think prayer. No, the word intercession means pleading. That's a courtroom term. Did you catch what I just said for those of you that are watching? The Bible says that the widow banged on the door of the unjust judge, not wanting answer to prayer, but wanting justice. Mm. That's what you need to do. That's why Jesus de dedicated a whole power. But he said, when I come back, will the son of man find faith? He's not talking about faith in the word. He's talking about faith in the heavenly judicial system that's in place. And what did the unjust judge said? I don't fear God. I don't fear man. But because this woman troubleth me, I'm going to see that she get justice, not get an answer to her prayer. And that's what the next verse says. Shall not God avenge? Avenge is another courtroom term. Avenge what? Avenge your bloodline and begin to resolve it and revoke. The issue is not receiving, it's revoking. Ooh. It's not receiving, it's revoking. It's about revoking. Lord, my bloodline has been into witchcraft. My bloodline has been into divorce. My bloodline has been into dishonor. There's been fraud in my bloodline. Lord, there's been perversion in my bloodline. Lord, give me justice, set me free. Because Lord, I, I did the first part. I've crucified the flesh, I'm still dealing with it. I went through multiple deliverance sessions, I'm still dealing with it. Lord, this gotta be a generational curse in my blood. Lord, what did my bloodline do? to be able to initiate the curse. And if you give the courtroom of heaven some time, sometimes the Holy Spirit will give it to you right there. And other times God will send you an answer within a season and begin to speak to you in dreams, begin to speak to you in visions, begin to speak to you with uh, epiphanies and one of those aha moments where out of nowhere, you get an answer and you go, oh my God. Or you're around family members and you hear family members talking about things that happened in the past and the Holy Spirit says, pay attention. And then you realize, oh, that's where the root cause is happening. Or the Holy Spirit will tell you, you did this months ago, or you've been doing this. And this produces a generational curse. Let me give you one that most Christians do. They don't realize that they're doing it. That does produce a generational curse. Dishonor. Wow. Dis dishonor always produces a generational curse. This is why there's a reason why the Bible says, touch not my anointed. And the Bible also says, honor your father and mother. Um, it's the only commandment uh, with a promise, which means there's a legal thing going on there. Here's another way that a Christian can produce a generational curse or begin uh, to get a case filed against them. Uh, slandering, slandering your brother in in their character. This is why the Bible says, if you call someone raka or idiot, look what the Bible says, you are in danger of the court. That's what the text says. The yeah. text says, if you call someone an idiot, it actually says that in more modern translation, if you call someone an idiot or raka or slander them as a person, the Bible says, you are in danger of the court. Then the next verse says, agree with your adversary. Because yeah. if you don't, you will be put in prison and won't come out until you pay the last penny. What does that mean for us? Which means you're a Christian, but you're in prison. You're anointed, but you're in prison. Did you catch what I just said? You're yeah. Joseph. Oh. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. No, you're free, but you're still in prison, Joseph. Man, you got me preaching here, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, because no, here, here's the thing, because we're flowing. Me and you just have this crazy synergy. First Timothy chapter five, verse 20. This is going to blow some people's minds. Them that sin, it basically says rebuke them before all. These are talking about Christian leaders that the others may be in fear, the fear of God. 
as those who persist in sin, remove them in the presence of all so that they may the rest may stand in fear. So here's the thing, and I love what you're saying. There is a, uh, what, why is a curse visited upon dishonor? Because we are functioning within a kingdom, which is a judicial system of order, a hierarchy from the, I'm just going to go deep. If you guys want me to go deep, if you want Apostle Pagani go deep, drop in the comments and tell us. So hierarchy is a word that means from top to bottom. It's a kingdom. That means a king that literally has, it's a, a, um, a designation of authority, a hierarchy. It's just like in our government. We have in the United States a president, and then it goes down the line. Now, in the same way, and I love what you said. This is why this book is so important for this generation. Y'all better be buying it while I'm still explaining this. Here's the thing. People don't understand curses, and this is what Apostle said, because we've been given the paradigm of relationship but not governance. It's right. like we don't understand, like, we, and this is how I always preach it, because we kind of say the same things with different words, which is why I like rocking right. with you, because we always expand our vocabulary. I always preach it, uh, we're not just family, we're royal blood. So right. what happens when you come into adoption is you're not just adopted into a normal family. The, the, the family of heaven's not a middle-class family. You're moving into the kingdom and you become a son of the king. And so, right. you, but you have to understand the, um, the dual nature of the dynamic of that relationship. It's governmental. And it's so hard for us to understand this because we're born into a democracy. We right. vote in a president. We vote right. in the next, but the king is forever. He's Come the king on. of all kings. And so what happens is you get adopted into a royal family and so you have to understand the nature of both these, these relationships. So when I was quoting 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20, you, when you start understanding, like, how can dishonor bring a curse? It's because you are violating a hierarchy. You are now um, basically a rebel or rogue against the government of heaven. Right. You're on earth. You're violating it. And so right. that's why I even tell people, like, if you say, well, I only have a house church and, you know, I am the church and I don't go to church. Well, the ironic thing about that is you're reading a Bible that has at least three layers of leadership represented just in the New Testament epistles. Come on. And when you go old covenant, you're still looking at a hierarchy all the way down. And so I love the way, fact that you connected that to a curse. So I didn't want to preach too much because you got me fired oh. up. But people need, I think what happens, Apostle Bagani, and I want to vindicate and validate you publicly right now, and I want to thank you for installing a full and complete understanding of the scriptures, because Billy Graham evangelism gave us relationship. Yes. Oh, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. But he filled stadiums, the Jesus revolution. Oh man, Jesus is my friend. Listen, Lord and Savior. <laughs> Lord is the language of government. When right. you're the Lord, you are over land, which is dominion and everything right. on it. That's kingdom language. And so what I believe this book is doing, and this is why we're doing this broadcast, is trying to help some of you understand you have Constantinian Christianity. You have Billy Graham evangelical uh, relational Christianity, but you don't have governmental Christianity. Right. And this is first century. So I don't Good. know if you tag off on that well well, well 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 here's the thing is is that you know most christian think promises but heaven thinks legislation that's just the way that it is christians they're always thinking relationship and promises god is always thinking law uh jurisdiction and legislation you know as a matter of fact god is more legal than he is relational and i'm going to show you this even all throughout the bible number one let's look at this both the word testament is a legal term. It, testament is a legal term. It means a will. So you got old will, Old Testament, New Testament. James says perfect law of liberty. So it actually says he that looks into the perfect law, L-A-W, of liberty. That means deliverance is a constitution. It's a law. There, there, there are laws in play. The term binding and loosing, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth. That word loose means permit, not permit. See, wow. people think permit relationship. Oh, I permit you to be in my life. No, the word loose is permit. 
those of us that are, you're a pastor, I'm a pastor, you could build a building, do the best construction in a building, follow all the laws of how to build it right. But if you don't have the permit to build, when the city comes to do an inspection, <laughs> they will make you take it down and tell you, get the permit first, then build. <laughs> so, that's the, so this is how the text should be read. Whatever you permit on earth will be permit in the courtroom of heaven. Yeah. Right? The word amen is a legal word. It means so be it. It's not a relational term. It's a legal term. So when we say amen, it's a legal term, which means when a decree was released in any kind of uh, courtroom, they would say amen, so be it. Yeah. The, now watch this. The Bible actually says, believe in the Lord, you will inherit everlasting life. The word inherit, it doesn't say receive. That's modern translation. King James says, inherit everlasting life. Inherit is a legal term. The Bible actually doesn't even call us sons and daughters. Uh, it says sons and daughters of the most high. That's relationship. But it actually says we are citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. As a matter of fact, the Bible even goes a step further. It says where two or three are gathered. That's a legal term. That's a legal requirement for testimony of truth in a courtroom. The Bible says pronounce judgment at the mouth of two to three witnesses. That's why Jesus said if two or three agree on earth as touching anything. The Bible also says we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And I'll give you one more just to show your viewers that this whole thing is legal. He whom the sun sets free is free indeed. No, that's not how it should be read. It's a compound word. Is free in the deed. Yeah. In the deed, which means those of you that are homeowners understand what it means, the title deed, not indeed relationship. Amen. We can do that. That makes good preaching, right? But the text says, he whom the son sets free is free in the deed, which means even if I don't feel like it, the deed on the paperwork here says, it's my name on it. I have my right to be free. So what we're trying to do, and the whole concept of generational curses is predicated upon the legislation that Christians are still to abide by, because not only are we a chosen people, relationship, we are a royal priesthood, legislation. See how that works? So it's royal, which means there are rules and regulations to the courtroom, and then priesthood, there are rules and regulations in the tabernacle. So it's all mixed in there. This is why, yes, a Christian can be spirit filled and still dealing with a generational curse because they have violated either through ignorance or willful disobedience the legislation of the courtroom of heaven. And depending on the infraction or the transgression committed will depend on the level of penalty of judgment. Robbery in the first degree, robbery in the second degree, robbery in the third degree. Okay, so if I get a lustful thought, I'm not gonna get cursed by it. But if I live in fornication, I will open my door to a generational curse of fornication. Man, you got me preaching here. I'm getting excited, man. No, listen, you know, and I wanna say to everybody watching right now, Apostle Pagani is actually not teaching anything new. He's reinstalling something that got deleted out of the conversation, that got deleted from the pulpit because preachers preach to their preferences. Preachers preach towards their own personal, you know, their, their, their own opinion. So this is not, for many of you watching right now who are thinking, oh, this is a new revelation. This is a first century, normal, institutionalized, they would have all understood it. They, in, you know, Roman occupied first century Jewish being converted to Christianity. They understood law. This was normal to them. That's why Jesus spoke this language. So I just want to st step back because I feel like there's some people who are like, man, this is a new revelation. No, he is simply reinstalling something that got lost in denominationalism. It got lost. Like I mentioned, Constant Constantine showed up, made a government sanctioned version of Christianity called Roman Catholicism. And you just, all this stuff. So a lot of what we're doing is retracing ancient paths 
and saying, let me recontextualize what they decontextualize. Let me, let me help you understand what it really meant, not what you got in westernized modern Christianity. If you're thankful for that, smash that thumbs up right now. I'm going to add a little bit, and then I, I got a question connected to this. But think about this. In the beginning was the word. That's, that's legal talk. Why? Because we have a written constitution in the American, in the U.S. government. But when you have a king, the king's word is the law. Whatever proceeds out of his mouth is. The, so in the beginning was the word. The, you, I hear that legally. And so when Jesus showed up, what gave him authority as, as God's only begotten son, there's a delegation of authority. He's 100% God. He's now speaking through that 100% man, and he's demonstrating for us dominion, which is also a legal term. I will give you authority. <laughs> I will give, you know, it's, let me just say this, and I think this is a really good example, and I, I preached this at the Deliverance Conference recently, but I have two daughters. When they were arguing over who gets to play with which toy, one daughter came to me and said, you know, she's not sharing. I said, you go back upstairs and you tell Everly, I said she has to share the toy. Well, that's a delegation of authority. I'm the priest of my home. I lead, I'm over my children in a hierarchy. And so when my daughter told the other daughter, dad said so, it, she is a recipient of my authority. So look, it's both relationship and hierarchy. It's both of them. And so then, and so guess what? My daughter didn't obey my other daughter. My daughter obeyed uh, me through my daughter. So it's, so when you tell a demon come out, they're not obeying you. They're obeying the jurisdiction, the authority of the courtroom of heaven through your father. And they're saying, I'm, I'm listening to the one who gave the authority through them. But it's both. It's relationship through hierarchy. So let me ask you this, because I know we've been going for almost an hour and I'm so thankful for your time. But what now, how does this affect deliverance? Like how how does a curse interact with a demon? Love you know, it. Yeah, maybe talk about that. I know that's basic for some people, but how does this interact with deliverance? Okay, first and foremost, let's establish that a generational curse and a demon, they're not the same thing. Yeah. Demons are the enforcers of the curse, not the initiators of it. Mm. Demons can't impose a curse on someone unless they have the legal right to do so. They carry out, the demons carry out the judgment that the courtroom of heaven has sanctioned. That's their current role when it comes to this. They don't initiate it. Now, mm. does the kingdom of darkness uh, put hexes and curses on people. Obviously, I kind of get into that. You got Satanism, uh, people that, that are into the occult sending curses on people. That's another level of sending a curse coming from the kingdom of darkness. But initially, when it comes into the life of the believer, they are not the initiators of the curse. They are the enforcers of the curse. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't initiate it. So I think the believer needs to kind of understand uh, the difference uh, between the two. Now, this is how it started for me. I'm going to tell you why I wrote this book because I got, and, and Pastor Mike, you could agree with me on this. I got sick and tired of taking the same people through deliverance. Mm. I got frustrated with taking the same person over and over and over and over again. And amen. Those of you that need multiple deliverances, I'm telling you, go for it. But I begin to question uh, what went wrong with the with their last deliverance that here they are on my line again in my church. And this is like this sixth deliverance session. So I begin to question what am I doing wrong? Yeah. And what are they doing wrong? That was where the thought came to me of god what is going on either deliverance works or it doesn't or it doesn't work so i began to entertain the idea of maybe there's some deliverance idolatry going on and deliverance addiction and yes there's a place for that and yes, yes. Uh, i mean christians need to get delivered from uh deliverance addiction it's about christ not deliverance you know but I began to say, Lord, what am I doing wrong or what are they doing wrong? And I heard the Holy Spirit say, none of you are doing anything wrong. This is not a demon issue. This is a generational curse issue. Wow. And that's It was just a simple thought, generational curse. And then Isaiah 58 came into mind. Mm. 
said, this is, is not this the fast that I have chosen? And then it says this, to loose the bands of wickedness. Wow. Which means that this particular pattern of behavior, it's like a rope that's tied around them and they need to be loosed from it. Notice that the text doesn't say get deliverance from the bands of, uh, get deliverance, yeah, uh, yeah. stop wickedness. It says get loosened from it. So I said, okay, God. And it began a five year journey. This book is the result of five years. This book was supposed to come out a year after this book. So this book has been out since 2018 by God's grace, the secrets of deliverance, which we're going to give away. We made our 500 subs. We're going to no give problem. you a link so that you could download it. All right. So, um, in a little bit, um, this book was supposed to come out a year after that book. And I just felt it, I wasn't ready for it. I, I wasn't ready. God was still showing me stuff. So this book is five and a half years, almost six years for wow. its part two. And it was because I, I began to question, okay, God, why is there such a epidemic of deliverance addiction and deliverance idolatry going on that the heresy hunters are picking up on that? Because no one, you and I, you know, you and I know that we don't have deliverance idolatry. As a matter of fact, to get us to blame it on a demon, it takes a lot because we troubleshoot the flesh. We troubleshoot whether yeah. irresponsibility, personal responsibility. We tell people submit to God, resist the devil, and the devil will flee, which is preventative uh, measure of freedom. By the time we get to deliverance, you and I and Isaiah and the demon slayers, that's like the last thing that we do. Okay, this is obviously a demon at this point, and we take them through deliverance. So I begin to question. And I began to explore the idea of this might not be a person issue uh, or a being issue. This might be a bloodline issue. Wow. So I said, God, this might be a bloodline issue. And I began to look through the scriptures and I began to see it all over in the New Testament. And let me just throw this out there. Yes, generational curses is in the epistles. Now, I know that's a that's a shocker for many of you, but let me show it. Let me let me show it to you. First uh, John, chapter one, verse seven says, if you confess your sins, right, he is faithful. Notice how that verse we've been talking about it leading up to this point. We've been saying it's not just relational, it's legislative as well. It's legal. Right. Watch this. Watch this. The Bible says if you confess your sins, the word confess is not tell. That's a legal term. The word confess is another legal term. You only confess in a courtroom. What if I tell a person, no, that's telling someone. It doesn't say tell your faults to one another. It says confess your faults to one another. So it says this, if you confess your sins, he is faithful, relationship, and just, legal, to forgive you of your sins, relationship, and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness, generational curse. Let me let me let me say it again. Let me say it again. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin, but to also cleanse you of the curse that's empowering that wickedness and causing you to sin. It's hidden right there. Most evangelicals stop at forgive us of our sin and keep walking. No, it says and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is a legal term. Notice how the verse doesn't start off saying, if you confess your unrighteousness. <laughs> and I'm preaching. You got me preaching here, Pastor Let's Mike. Go. If you can say, if you confess your, your unrighteousness. He, no, it says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just. Relational, he's your father and just, he's your judge to forgive you of your sin through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus' work on the cross, blood of Jesus. But then it also says this, to cleanse you of all unrighteousness, break the generational curse that's empowering this, that sin. Now watch this. That verse is not written to unbelievers. Yeah. That verse is written to Christians. You know how I know? Because the chapter starts off by saying, I write unto you, little children. 
Ah, it says, I write it to you, little children. <laughs> so it's not talking about unbelievers. It's talking about believers. And if you're watching me right now, if you have passed the submission test and things are still acting up, it's a demon. If you got deliverance and you got rid of the demon and the area is still acting up, you're dealing with a generational curse. But I'm here to tell you the curse breaker, Jesus, and the work that he did on the cross is available. The efficacy of Christ's work on the cross, Christ crucified. What he did on the cross is available to not just forgive you of your sin. First John chapter two, verse, verse one, he's the propitiation for our sin. But not only that, the curse breaking power of the Holy Ghost is here to cleanse you. Cleanse what? That's a bloodline issue. Cleanse me from what? Bloodline kicking about in your own blood and no one washed you. It's available for you right now. And all you have to do is not pray to the courtroom. No, you plead to the courtroom through your intercessor who is who jesus the intercessor for he ever liveth to make intercession for us wait 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 wait. it doesn't say he ever liveth to make prayers for us no intercession is a legal term your high priest jesus is the curse breaker he ever liveth to plead for your bloodline in your life active and set you free from what is keeping you bound by a generational curse. And you can do that right now. As a matter of fact, I want you to write it in the chat room. Lord Jesus, set me free from the curse. Go ahead and write it in the chat room. Go ahead and write it, write it in the chat room right now so that you can begin the process. So you might be asking, how does it begin right now? By banging or, or pleading for mercy at the court. That's what it means. Applying mercy in the courtroom. Oh, where? Mercy seat in the courtroom. Uh, go through Jesus to God right now and say, Lord, I'm dealing with a curse. Write it down on a piece of paper and God will begin to reveal it to you. And then I want to encourage you, after you did all of that, you want confirmation on what God told you, you need to go get this book, The Secrets to Deliverance. As a matter of fact, it's pinned in the comment, both on YouTube and Facebook. But what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give you a free ebook copy uh, just for this broadcast for a couple of hours, a free ebook copy of my book, The Secrets to deliverance because you have subscribed for 500 people right now in jesus name mike i'm fired up i'm uh, fired up putting the link in the chat room right on, now fam in that chat as for me and my house we will serve the lord i want you somebody needs to get a revelation of this because people are coming up under the power of god i just felt such a release of freedom as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, that is a legal language in and of itself. It's saying it's not just about me, it's about my household as well. And so when you begin to deal in the area of generational curses, you're saying, as for me and my house, you Come know, on. you're normalizing the things that we do in deliverance. When we get together in a group, and we all start confessing. I'm confessing on behalf of the Signorelli line, lust, perversion, murder. You begin to go through that, Lord, I'm pleading the blood of Jesus. Doesn't that phrase make more sense? I'm pleading that the blood would wash me. This is a legal exchange. And as for me and my house, it may run in my family, but I am where it runs out. We're not gonna transmit these things to our children. And so these broadcasts, I'm telling you, it's not just about, oh, oh, I get it. We're trying to sell books. No, we are trying to give you the legal language to begin to deal with some things that the language of relationship in Christianity did not equip you to deal with. 
Come we on. are trying to give you. Matter of fact, I was laughing because I said, I want to hold the book up during the broadcast, Julie. Where is my book, The Secrets to Generational Curses? And Julie said, I got it, and it's with me, and she's on the other side of town right now. So the Cigarellis <laughs> fight over this book. I got to buy another one. <laughs> there, yeah. So this is what it looks like. So right now my wife and I are, because why? It's possible to be saved but still be in chains. It's possible to be saved but still have curses that you're dealing with. Repeated behaviors, patterns of behavior that show up in the form of curse. You know, it's possible for you to be saved and yet there are demons in you that are enforcing that curse. I want to say this because we're coming to a close. We've been on for an hour and I'm so thankful. But think about this. You know, Saul is vexed by demons. And if you go back and read those scriptures, it actually says, and he was visited by those demons from the Lord. And when people are new to all this impossible Ghani, they're always freaked out by the idea that, wait a second. And they're vis and Saul, the king of Israel, was visited by demons and the Lord sent them. Yes, that's legal. And it's legal. Why? Because he's a just God. And now, what, oh, now what, let, me, let me interject because you got me fired up with what you just said. This is why God told Samuel, stop pleading for him. Yes. Yes. The text says, what was Samuel doing? He was interceding on Saul's behalf. And what did God say? Stop interceding for him. Stop pleading for him in the courtroom. For I have rejected him, which means the decree is already out. He's rejected yep. his kingdom. I'm giving to another. Yep. That whole thing of Samuel and God telling Samuel to stop praying. It wasn't because of relationship. God loves Saul. God loves yep. Saul. He loves Saul. It was a legal moment. This is why, watch this. Even David understood legalities when he sinned with Bathsheba concerning the baby. Yeah, yes. What did he do? He told the, he told the servants, I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray. Perhaps God will change his mind. Yeah. Where? In the courtroom. So David was interceding in the courtroom. Let me give you another one. When God told Hezekiah, you're going to die in three days, get your house in order. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and pleaded before the courtroom. And before Isaiah left the palace, Isaiah had to go back and tell him, God has heard your supplication in the courtroom. And God sent a new decree. And God says, the three days have been extended to 15 years. And I want to tell somebody that's watching me right now, don't cut your destiny short. Don't cut your blessing short. Don't cut what God has called you to do short because of this present day curse that's activated in your life. Plead before the courtroom of heaven right now and i promise you god will send another decree another law and a greater law will trump out the lesser law and god will shift and turn your bloodline around you don't have to die in your sin you don't have to lose anything as a matter of fact god says if i break the curse over your life i will restore you know what that word restore means? Yeah, come on with it's it. It's a legal term. It's not relationship. It's a legal term. It means restitution. Restitution is a legal term. It means yeah. I will restitute the years that the canker worm has eaten. That, mm. It's all legal. It's yeah. all legal. Get set free now in the name of Jesus. And then I want you to go out. The link is pinned in the comment. After this broadcast, go and pick up this book and buy two. One for you and one for somebody that you know that probably won't buy the book because they have stigma concerning curses and deliverance. You buy it and I want you to give it to your pastor as a gift. Give it to them in love. Say, Pastor, I yeah. bought a gift for you. I got this really good book. I thought I'd give it to you. Now, don't force it on your pastor and don't throw it at your pastor and say, you need to read this book and get delivered. No, don't do that. Honor <laughs> your pastor and say, Pastor, I bought this book that I think it would be a blessing to you. You can read it. And I want you to buy it and make sure you get it into the hand of everyone. Make sure as we close out, the link for you to download the free ebook copy just for a couple of hours and then it's not activated anymore. You could download it. I already put it in the chat room. But here's what I want you to do. If you were blessed by everything that I shared today, all I'm asking is this, is follow me on YouTube. 
We're almost we're at the 99,000 something. We're almost at the cusp of 100K. And I want you to follow me. So I'm going to put the link again in the chat room. And I want you to make sure that you subscribe to us. Pastor Mike, thank you. Oh, thank so you good. for having me on. Me and you can tag team preach like none other. I, I got to like cut, try to stop myself because I'm thinking about Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 come boldly before the throne of grace. That's big language. Come boldly before the throne of grace. It's you got to come before the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find Ooh. grace. And so it's like, whew, so you go. Mercy is grace. legal. Mercy is legal. Grace is relational. It's there. Once you See it, you can't unsee it. Now, I want to say something because I got I got something that dropped in my spirit. And I don't know if anybody's ever told you this before. It's not just about you going number one because you've gone number one repeatedly. I believe there are certain ministers that God gives permission to write the classics, to write the you know the, the those books that it's like this is essential, this is fundamental. And when I was thinking about your life the other day, I feel that there's a grace on you that the Lord said, I'm going to give him permission to write the fundamental, the, the classic. That's why we're doing this stream, because there's so many of you that this book is, this is a classic. This book is a fundamental. This is, there's certain books you have to have in your library and you know people by their library. You know, when people show up to my office and they see my library, they're like, oh yeah, you, you know, you're a real one. This is one of those books. It just came out, but I'm already calling it a classic, just like your previous book. And so, guys, we're spamming the chat. You can get the link. It's pinned in the comment. I want you to go jump over to his channel and subscribe. I got to jump off. I'm going to spend a few more minutes with you guys uh, telling you about some really important things that we have going on. Can you guys all just shout out Pastor Apostle Pagani right now in the chat? Show him some love. Man, thank you for your contribution to the kingdom. Everybody stick around for a few more moments. I want to talk to you about some really crazy things going on right now. And so jump, don't jump off just yet. But thank you, Apostle Bagani, for today. This was off the charts. Thank you for having me on. And I love all of your followers. I see you guys at the next <laughs> Slayer podcast. Love all of you. I'm Bye. gone. <laughs> love you guys.